You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Live from the Judiciary's Television Studios in Washington, D.C., the Federal Judicial Center presents Implementing Monograph 114. Hello, and welcome to our tele-training session on Monograph 114. I'm Dave Leathery with the Federal Judicial Center, your moderator for today's broadcast. As you may know, Monograph 114 is a new statement of policy published by the Administrative Office. Most officers will find that the document doesn't break any new ground. Instead, it's more of a consolidation of existing policies. All the same, most districts will see some procedural changes as a result of Monograph 114. So we're here today to answer your questions. Questions like, who needs to be involved? And where do we begin? Even, why is all of this important? To do that, we'll have commentary from Judge Gerald Rosen of the Criminal Law Committee and John Hughes, Chief of the Federal Corrections and Supervision Division. You'll hear from authors of the monograph, Associate General Counsel David Adair and Special Assistant Kim Watley from the AO. And then we'll get down to a nuts and bolts discussion on how to implement monograph 114. We'll hear what works and what doesn't from chiefs and officers and districts that pilot tested the monograph. We've also set aside time to answer your questions. You can fax them in any time, beginning now to the number on your screen. As you can see, we have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started with a look at the bottom line. Just why is monograph 114 important? For many, one big reason may be it can help bring a needed sense of justice to the victims of crime. Monograph 114 is a new policy and procedure statement that addresses the financial penalties levied by the federal courts. The monograph was driven in part by Congress's desire to encourage and improve the government's ability to collect criminal fines. It provides a clear and complete guide to the role of United States probation officers in bringing offenders into compliance in the payment of their monetary penalties. This area of financial penalties, particularly restitution, has become so complicated in the last 10 years that uh, I think uh, having this comprehensive source as a guide for probation officers is really important. It puts an emphasis on, it certainly gives a priority to, and it's nothing really new as, as opposed to what we were doing previously. But in this case, I think it, it, it really focuses the, the efforts of the officer. Why has government renewed its focus on monetary penalties? At least in part, it's because of the rising importance society is placing on restitution to the victims of crime. This excerpt from a video produced by the Department of Justice's Office for Victims of Crime offers a window into the devastation suffered by just one group of victims. Fraud victims do not fit any single demographic pattern. They are rich and poor, live in urban and rural areas, and have different levels of education. And contrary to what many people think, a majority of fraud victims are not elderly nor isolated. And unfortunately, I think these kind of scams against middle age or even younger types of people are really increasing. They're people that are working towards building their life savings. Um, this is often where you see the divorces because one family member blames the other especially where you've got two income households where they're both contributing and one convinces the other to participate in this kind of a fraud. In contrast to victims of violent crime, it can be a long time before fraud victims are identified and contacted by the federal justice system. The first step is recognizing the trauma that fraud victims can suffer. It tends to transcend other, other things in their lives and affects them both emotionally, it can affect their health, uh, it can affect their well-being and certainly their self-esteem. I feel like the whole basis of things has been torn apart. And I don't think we have the same They feel stupid, framework. they feel duped. Many do not want to share the information with their family. They are actually isolated in, in not wanting to tell family members that this has happened. Many other ones may have brought family members into the scheme and once it's been uncovered that family member blames the, that first victim or you know, blame someone else for what has happened and it creates all kinds of family dissension. My mate of 17 years, who's a little older than I am, like he's 71 now, he thought I was a fool. And Tammy and her husband were pretty upset I had to reimburse them. Federal law mandates restitution in most types of fraud cases. 
In many cases, it's difficult for victims to get back all their money, but it does happen. Once they did um, uh, convict Mr. Barson of charges, they actually did return some of the money to me as well. Regardless of whether restitution is paid, there's more than financial loss for victims of fraud. You know, it's humiliating and uh, it's frustrating. And it's to know that there's someone out there like that who's taking everyone's money. I think dealing with the emotional impact of what's happened with financial fraud victims is probably the very second toughest thing to actually have to having to tell them that they probably won't get their money back. Um, but it, it can be very devastating for these kind of victims. I remember feeling very angry. I felt helpless. I, I felt very much in their power. Helping victims like these find justice gives officers a first-rate opportunity to make a difference in someone's life. For many officers, there's no stronger bottom line, and it's one that's facilitated by Monograph 114. Policy statements such as Monograph 114 typically arise to answer a need within the system. To learn more about that, we're pleased to welcome Judge Gerald Rosen, a member of the body that helps set the policy for the federal judiciary the Judicial Conference Committee on Criminal Law. He is also the chair of the subcommittee that oversaw the development of Monograph 114. Judge Rosen, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure to be here, David. I'm delighted to be here. Judge, can you explain why the committee decided to endorse the development of Monograph 114 on fines and restitution? Sure, I'll give it a try. Uh, my subcommittee was very involved in the development of the monograph and we ultimately recommended to the full committee that we proceed with the project. As the monograph explains in the introduction, the imposition and collection of monetary penalties has been the subject of some intense interest for the last 20 years or so. The Department of Justice, the Judiciary, and the Congress all have been concerned about this area for some time. Over the years, Congress has passed several pieces of legislation in an attempt to enhance the imposition and collection of criminal monetary penalties. The Criminal Law Committee has been involved as well from time to time, and former committee chairs and committee members have testified on the Hill to express the judiciary's views on proposed legislation, such as the mandatory victims' restitution laws and about the judiciary's roles in the collection process. The committee decided to endorse the development of this monograph after learning about a general accounting office report that criticized how offender payment schedules were being determined. Although the committee did express some concerns after reviewing the initial draft GAO report, and we did recommend some substantial revisions, we ultimately agreed that performance in this area could be improved, and therefore we supported the development of the monograph. Judge, in the committee's view, what is the monograph intended to do? Well, uh, generally, the monograph consolidates and updates previous administrative policy uh, in, this, in the area of criminal monetary penalties. Since it has been adopted by the Judicial Conference, it represents judiciary policy, although it does allow tremendous flexibility to the individual courts to develop standards based on their own individual needs. Second, secondly, and uh, I think equally as important, the monograph reinforces a long-standing judiciary view that the Department of Justice has the primary responsibility for fine and restitution collection. That's a position that has not changed. Now, clearly probation officers play a pivotal role, and each officer has the responsibility to make recommendations to judges to monitor compliance with a sentence. However, the judiciary has limited fiscal resources, and so we are not able to train every officer to be a financial expert, nor to audit the financial records of every single offender, some of whom may not have the means to pay fines or restitutions. Uh, moreover, the judiciary cannot assume executive branch enforcement authority to collect delinquent debts. But we can promote communication, coordination, and cooperation among the various court units and government agencies responsible for this area. So, within that framework, I'm pretty confident that the monograph will accomplish what the committee intended for it. Thank you so much, Judge Rosen, for sharing your perspective with us and for taking the time to join us. I'm happy to be here. Judge Rosen mentioned communication, coordination, and cooperation. Those qualities were built early into Monograph 114, being the hallmark of the process through which it was developed. 
John Hughes, chief of the Federal Corrections and Supervision Division, described that process in a recent interview with the FJC's Robin Rowland. In April of 99, Director Meekham approved the establishment of an expert working group made up of uh, eight officers from around the country uh, who would come to Washington and, and pull together all the various policies on fine and restitution and uh, put it all in one place as the basis for a new monograph, which, became, which is now the monograph 114. Those, their efforts were run by other experts in the Department of Justice, for example, and the Bureau of Prisons uh, to see if they could help us make this even more comprehensive. And so that culminated in uh, a first draft, or an outline of a draft, I should say, before the Criminal Law Committee in December of 99. The committee was pleased that all this had been pulled together, finally, into one place, but they asked us if we couldn't put it out for wider comment and, uh, and get other views as well. So what we did following that December meeting was form another working group. And that was, and first we went to the chief's advisory group and talked to them about it, about how to proceed. And most of them volunteered their own districts to, uh, to test it out and supplied a deputy chief or a supervising officer to work with us on this. The idea being to not only work out the bugs and, and find out what we can improve before we imp implement the new monograph, but to make it more practical to officers. And we, we, they tried it out for two months, and it really was a good idea because what they came up with, also working with the FJC, was uh, an implementation plan which uh, is really going to help us implement this quickly and avoid confusion. For example, the working group and the FJC suggested that we have an implementation kit, kind of a checklist for a chief to follow when, uh, when implementing the policy. For example, uh, what do you say to the judge? What do you say to the public defender? Mm -hmm. How do you uh, work with the financial litigation unit to make sure you touch all the bases and get off to a good start? The, the uh, group also suggested that we uh, come up with a lesson plan so that the training officer or the SUSPO or whoever's doing the training in the district for the probation officers has something that would help them get off to a fast start. And finally, uh, they suggested that we work, that the FJC and the division work very closely to make sure that monograph 114 and the FJC's desk reference are completely compatible mm -hmm. and, and not redundant in any way. And I think these are all pretty good suggestions, and in my opinion, that's how we ought to be doing business from now on when we come up with a new policy. Work with the experts in the field, test things out with the people in the field, and have a lot of interagency cooperation. So far, it's clear that a consensus building process has been vitally important in the development of Monograph 114. But perhaps even more important to officers is the idea of consolidation. As we've mentioned, the monograph brings together existing policy, giving officers a single, comprehensive resource to turn to. In a minute, we'll take a closer look at the monograph itself with its authors, David Adair and Kim Watley. While I join them on the set, check out these opinions about monograph 114 from chiefs in the districts that reviewed and pilot tested it. Well, I think the system realized that there was a need uh, to improve our financial investigations, particularly in our pre-sentence reports. Uh, while we did a good job investigating other aspects of the defendant, uh, there were some improvement that could be made um, in the financial uh, uh, side. Uh, we don't think of ourselves or haven't thought of ourselves as financial investigators and, and realizing this need where we uh, developed the 114. Monograph 114 is important because it provides one comprehensive source for policy and procedure and statutory provisions related to financial penalties. I think it also provides uh, a source for guidance for probation officers, uh, particularly in the area of developing a cooperative partnership with the Department of Justice, in particular the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Clerk's Office. If a case is transferred to us from another district or if we transfer a case to another district that has these monetary sanctions, then certainly the efforts that have been done in one district should mirror those that are done in the, the receiving district. I think it will make our jobs a little bit easier from that perspective. 
Monograph 114 offers officers a consistent approach in uh, determining financial penalties, both at the investigation stage, uh, the assessment process, the uh, recommendation, and the collection process. So the, uh, the clear guidelines and, and the consistent approach are there for the officers, and they appreciate that. Next, we're going to continue our look at the monograph by taking a, a closer look at its intricacies. To do that, we welcome Kim Watley, Special Assistant with the Federal Corrections and Supervision Division, and David Adair, Associate General Counsel, both with the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts. Both of these individuals have been involved with the monograph since day one, through the design, the development, the extensive writing process, and, and the delivery and refinement of, of the monograph. They've worked with numerous stakeholders along the way, Department of Justice, they've worked with the field, they've worked with the Judicial Conference and, and others to bring the monograph to its current shape. So we welcome you today with us to talk a little bit more about the monograph and share with our viewers an overview of the monograph and what it is it is specifically designed to cover. Kim and David. Thank you, David. I'll get started. The idea for a monograph on criminal monetary penalties began to take shape shortly after the Federal Corrections and Supervision Division distributed its September 1995 Memorandum on Restitution and Fines. Directly on the heels of that memorandum, the 1996 Mandatory Victim Restitution Act was passed, and there were a number of other significant developments in the area. In response to these developments, a great deal of information was provided to and created by officers, but there was no one place where officers could go to get help in dealing with financial penalties. The monograph is essentially an attempt to create such a resource for officers. There are actually only a few matters there that are new in the monograph, and what Kim and I want to do today is highlight those matters, those that are substantively new and those that provide a new emphasis on the probation officer's role in dealing with monetary penalties. We'll start, though, by describing the organization of the monograph, which is useful in understanding how it can help officers with financial penalty cases. Kim? Thanks, David. Well, we tried to organize the monograph according to the work processes that an officer, either a pre-sentence writer or supervision officer, might use on a case. First, in determining the type and amount of penalties that could be imposed in a particular case, then in formulating a sentencing recommendation as required by the Mandatory Victims Restitution Act, and then straight through the supervision process and noncompliance with payment. The monograph is divided into seven chapters. The first chapter provides a historical perspective, how we got where we are today. Chapter 2 defines all the different types of criminal monetary penalties, fees, and other costs that could be imposed in a given case. This chapter includes a number of charts that summarize the statutes on special assessments, fines, and restitution. Chapter 3 walks officers through the process of determining the penalty exposure for any given defendant. And Chapter 4 introduces the new series of financial forms. And Chapter 5 is devoted to describing the current case law when it comes to recommending penalties. Chapter 6 focuses on supervision issues. And finally, Chapter 7 describes an implementation strategy and program management. Throughout the monograph, I think you'll see a repeated theme regarding the role of the United States Attorney's offices in identifying victims and losses and in collecting criminal debts. U.S. attorneys have always had a clearly defined role in collection, but the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act, Act enhanced that authority. Uh, the Act also clarified the U.S. attorney's role in identifying victims and losses. Accordingly, the monograph suggests that co officers coordinate with the flu unit of the U.S. Attorney's offices in all appropriate stages of the process. David, when we begin the development of the monograph, we coordinated closely with the Department of Justice through its financial litigation staff at the Executive Office for U.S. Attorneys, and we consulted with financial litigation experts in the system so that they could streamline some of the processes, the victim notification procedures, for example, so that we could try to eliminate duplication wherever possible. Another important theme reflected in the monograph is fair and equal treatment among defendants and offenders. That theme is projected first in the, the detailed guidance provided for probation officers to accessibility to pay. This guidance can help reduce disparities in the way penalties are imposed and collected. The detailed financial statements introduced in the monograph also promote this goal, both at sentencing and during supervision. The old financial statement combined net worth and net monthly income information together in one form, but the new statements, the net worth statement, the net worth short form statement, and the cash flow statement are designed to separate and emphasize the different analyses that can best determine the ability to make an immediate lump sum payment at the time of sentencing 
and the monthly payment schedules typically developed during supervision. The new net worth short form statement was created for use for defendants and offenders with limited assets and abilities, which as we all know will be the great majority. The forms also include a request that the defendant provide asset and income information on spouses or other significant others and dependents living at home. Also to report assets the defendant intends to liquidate to satisfy any penalties imposed. The first change recognizes the amendments made by the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act. These clarify the importance and the relevance of the assets owned, jointly owned, or controlled by the defendant. Also the liabilities, the financial needs, and the earning uh, ability of the defendant and his or her dependents. Now it's clear that all of these are relevant to the court's decision about the defendant's ability to pay. The second change alerts the defendant that specific assets will be considered in assessing the ability to pay and that defendants may have to liquidate assets to satisfy the penalties imposed. There's also a list of allowable expenses to be considered by the officer in determining a, an offender's ability to pay. It was designed as a guideline and it's not binding. The officer is still free to use her good judgment in individual cases. Finally, the monograph promotes consultation with defense counsel. Consultation with the government is necessary. The monograph suggests that consultation with defense counsel is strongly encouraged. For example, an adjustment to a schedule may not require a hearing, particularly when the offender doesn't object. But counsel might help by assisting the offender to determine a realistic payment plan or by encouraging a defendant to make his best efforts to pay. Furthermore, CJA counsel could be authorized at this stage, since failure to pay in accordance with the schedule could lead to a violation proceeding. So notice to counsel of record may begin the procedure to determine whether CJA representation is authorized and appropriate. Kim? You know, David, we designed the monograph to give the greatest flexibility to the courts. It provides a number of suggested standards based on best practices, then encourages each district to develop its own standards based on the economic circumstances or the culture and values in each district, and then to apply them fairly and equally. It preserves the officer's ability to use their own judgment in individual cases and encourages them to document those decisions. Another important issue that the monograph deals with, as it must, is the difficult issue of payment plans even though, though the case law in this area continues to evolve. More and more courts seem to be following the literal holding in United States versus Ahmad, which held that the court may not delegate to the probation officer the function of setting binding payment schedules that the offender must comply with on pain of revocation. Some cases and some circuits have suggested practical means of dealing with this basic holding, but in general, more and more courts are finding reduced authority on the part of the probation officer. The monograph includes a discussion of the current case state of the law as well as what we consider to be the most practical ways of dealing with those cases to date. Those suggestions are also the basis of the design of the most recent judgment in a criminal case, Form AO 245B, which is also intended to provide flexibility to deal with evolving case law. That means, of course, that for now, officers will have to continue to follow the case law in their circuits on the payment schedule issue. That's right, David. Chapter 5 in the monograph describes the statutory requirements for restitution and fine payment terms and also discusses the case law. It also provides advice on how to make payment recommendations and it mirrors the payment option language found in the revised judgments. Appendix E contains a sample of the revised judgment and the director of the administrative office will soon distribute copies of the new judgment including the amended and revocation judgments and the judgments created for organizational defendants and for petty offenses. All of the word perfect judgments have been updated on the JNET and are now available for court use. The monograph identifies a lot of other tools that officers might use, including a list of sources for financial records. It also discusses the need for a comparative analysis and it encourages officers not sim to simply rely on what an offender tells them about their financial condition. The monograph describes intermittent and graduated sanctions and it identifies most of the enforcement collection tools available to the Department of Justice. It encourages coordination with the Financial Litigation Unit to make sure these tools are used when appropriate, particularly before requesting a revocation proceeding. Thank you, Kim. We've stressed the function of the monograph as a resource for both pre-sentence writers and supervision officers. 
Of course, taken as a whole, the monograph will only apply to a small percentage of the defendants and offenders in the federal system. However, when districts are familiar with the procedures and have made a good implementation effort, they'll be better able to determine which cases most need their energy and resources in imposing and, and supervising the payment of criminal monetary penalties. Thank you for that very helpful overview. Kim and David will be returning a little bit later during the segment of the program that we've set aside for questions and answers. And just want to remind you to send in your questions. We really want to focus on those kind of questions related to implementation. So we look forward to you joining us a little bit later. Over the next few moments, uh, you'll be seeing some more taped footage from chief probation officers who are involved in the pilot testing and review of the monograph. And during that time, I'm going to be joined from some with, by some officers from the districts who are involved. So we'll be back with you in just a moment as we're going to be switching gears to talk about implementing monograph 114. I, I think it's very important to get the court, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, and even the public defender uh, involved in this process and, and, and meet with them to explain uh, why it's necessary that w that we change uh, our investigation and this in and why the information is important to the court and, and really uh, um, why it's important for the defendant to, to disclose uh, uh, the information. And then the other thing certainly is you need to advise the courts of the changes because the judges at the pre-sentence level are certainly going to see some things different as far as the focus of the financial section of the pre-sentence report is concerned. And of course, at the supervision level, we need the court support to really enforce these financial sanctions. What we did find out uh, by using the forms um, that were developed, if a person had financial uh, assets and, and uh, the wherewithal to, uh, to make restitution or a fine payment, those forms were, were very beneficial in um, uh, determining what assets were, were available. We also found that most of our, our uh, defendants don't have the means to pay a fine or restitution. And what developed was a short form to, to, to really deal with the majority of defendants that come uh, before our court that don't have the means, uh, and we can do it a quick, a quick assessment. We hope you find the background information we've provided so far to be helpful. In fact, we've designed this program so you can use some of the tapes in your own in-district training. But now we're going to be really switching gears, and we're going to be taking a look at the process of implementing Monograph 114. We've been working for some months now with those officers who served as project managers uh, during the pilot testing period, really working with them in, in dis discussion and dialogue in terms of what were the best practices, what works, what didn't work, and those things that can be transferable and replicated from one district to another. And today we've put together a panel of, of I want to say experts, but uh, and ex practitioners are, who have joined us here in the studio. To my right is Shane Ferguson, supervising USPO from Texas Eastern. Welcome. Thank you. Clayton Foster, supervisor from New Hampshire. Welcome. Thank you. And to my left, David Looney, chief from, from Portland, Oregon. Welcome, David. Thank you, David. And also joining us, we're fortunate enough to have three other districts represented and who, who will be participating in this dialogue, and we'll be inviting their insights along the way. And that's going to be Randy Beal from New York Western Supervisor. We, we also have Patrick Craig. I hope Patrick's on the line with us, Deputy Chief from Kentucky Western. And last but not least, Ken Young, joining us as Deputy from Phoenix, Arizona, way out west. You should have received by now copies of, of, your, of the package with the supplies of the monograph and, and the implementation kit. If not, uh, they should be with you momentarily. In case you haven't uh, received those as of yet, uh, interim copies are available via the, the JNET. And we're going to be making some very general references to the implementation kit during our discussions today, but it's not essential that you have that in place. The kit does cont contain a sample action plan form, and what we're going to be doing uh, over the next 40 minutes or so will be outlining a four-step process for your, for your action plan, a, a fairly, I don't want to say simplistic, but we've tried to make it a fairly straightforward process for you in terms of how to get started, where to go with implementing this monograph, and how to follow up. The one thing we would suggest is you get ready, sharpen your pencils to get ready to take lots and lots of notes, because over the, over the next bit of here, you're going to be hearing lots of different ideas, things that hopefully pique your interest, and you want to follow up with in your local discussions and your local planning. So let's go with the, the, the first step, which is getting started. That process of getting started involves getting organized, starting your planning. And to help 
the discussion along, we let me turn it over to Dave Looney from Oregon. Thank you, David. Um, I think the preceding discussion is a point to the level of cooperation and collaboration that was really required in the development of Monograph 114. And we as members of the, the pilot districts are recommending a similar team approach to the districts. Uh, we believe the team can be made up of three to eight members and you should use the talents of a chief or deputy chief and a mix of supervisors from pre-sentence and supervision units. They can use other officers who have a special interest or perhaps an expertise in financial investigations. And a good way for the teams, I think, to get started or to orientate themselves uh, uh, in this is by watching the broadcast today or, or as, a, as a tape. And I'm, I'm glad we have as many teams watching today as we have. Uh, the teams can also review the implementation kit. And that kit involves uh, and includes some sample documents, some training materials, and some other in helpful information. And I don't want to underestimate the monograph 114 itself. I believe the teams should, should read it and review it carefully, paying special attention to the history of monetary penalties in the federal system, the victim's perspective, and what's, what procedures have changed and what has not changed for us. They can follow the sample action uh, plan which is provided in the implementation kit. And they should make certain that their implementation plans include the short-term goals which directly relate to implementation and as well as the step four which is the long range and the evaluative portion of the plan. Most of all, I hope that the districts will use the materials and customize their action plans and the flow of information to meet their own district's needs. Clayton, would you uh, care to share some of your experiences? Yes, I agree wholeheartedly with David. This really should be a collection of the best thinking that the districts can put together in order to formulate the implementation plan as quickly and as expeditiously as possible. One of the recommendations we might have for them is to create a summary that either can be discussed with the court or distributed to the other judges depending on the court culture or the size of the court mm -hmm. as to those things that are going to change because of the implementation of monograph 114 and also those things that are not going to change so that you might alleviate some of the fear of the major changes that people think about when new processes are, are put into place. Uh, I would also perhaps recommend that they create a sample handout package of all the new forms. Again, this will alleviate some of the concern about the new paperwork that people always fear when, when they hear about we have a new thing coming from Washington that we're going to have to implement. Uh, also, I agree with David that perhaps using segments of the implementation or the teletraining in their implementation will also work very well in helping to identify why this whole process was put together and, and why we're moving in this particular direction and then to discuss among themselves the best way it is for them in, within their court culture to identify the proper stakeholders and to inform the stakeholders of the changes that are going to be made. And I would emphasize that perhaps the best way to do that is to use methods that have proven successful in your districts before. Uh, if you have a procedure that works, don't change it because of this. Use it to help you implement this a little bit easier. David, some additional thoughts? Yes, and I think one of the, uh, these are good ideas, and I think one of the best ways is to address major changes very clearly with our people. I think uh, one of the best things is to, to get out the new forms and use them, show the officers what the long form is and what the short methods are, and to explain the differences and let them use them and handle them. Um, to talk to the clerks about the, the judgment and commitment orders that are new and the language which most efficiently I, um, I imposes monetary penalties um, and how to evaluate and set uh, efficient payment schedules or proper payment schedules and how to write enforceable supervision conditions. You know, Dave, there's also a section that, that there may be a cause of some concern in, in, in depending on how the district has handled collections in the past and that's the area of determining allowable and non-allowable expenses. Uh, if there's an area that's going to cause concern with, among the defense bar, this may be one area that's highlighted. And perhaps by taking the initiative to dealing with this question up front immediately, you can belay some of the fears of perhaps the defense bar of where we're going with this and whether we're becoming true draconian. And I might even uh, suggest that districts, while implementing this, perhaps have the court in whether policy format or in some fashion articulate what expenses will be allowed within their particular district or circuit and which will not and that might head off any potential legal challenges down the road and that and that somewhat volatile issue. I think another area David uh, is uh, 
the new and kind of is a, a new focus on the spousal assets and the assets of dependents. Uh, and to be fair, uh, their liabilities as well. Uh, we need to uh, encourage lump sum payments or uh, write orders that to make uh, penalties uh, collectible immediately when we can determine that assets uh, are sufficiently there to, to justify those kinds of orders. I think we need to decide when and how to bring in the U.S. Attorney's Financial Litigation Unit, both into our training and our implementation process and our future training, as well as uh, other stakeholders that are involved with us. I think we also, uh, in, in our implementation process, need to review the existing memorandum, memorandum of understanding that we have uh, with the U.S. Attorney's Office and with the clerks. And if it's out of date, we need to compose a new one. Shane, let me bring you into this. What are your thoughts? Sure. We'd just like to offer a few tips at this stage of the game. And the first thing is that you've got to accentuate the positive of the monograph. There was a lot of time and effort spent in developing it, but it's a tool for officers. It was developed to help them make their job easier in conducting financial investigations as well as setting payment plans. And of course, you're going to have some resistance because you're asking officers to change the way they've done things in the past. And that can be somewhat of a problem because they're going to see this monograph and all the information that's contained in it and think, oh my gosh, it's just one other constraint on my time. And so it's important for you at the very beginning to let them know that this is just a tool, that it's going to help them, it's going to help their efforts, and it's actually going to save them time in the long run. I'd like to uh, go to uh, ask Ken Young to comment. Ken, you, uh, you share with us some experiences uh, from your implementation of this uh, pilot out in, in Phoenix. Uh, pilot out in Phoenix. Uh, We're getting some feedback, Ken. Could you turn on your TV? Initial fears expressed by staff during the pilot project is that the practices and the policies of the monograph 114 may take officers more time to implement. Uh, as it turned out, these, fig these fears really proved to be unfounded based upon staff comments in the follow-up surveys. Staff recognized that quality investigations take time. However, they also recognized not all cases are going to require that in-depth financial investigation. Staff really stated that the 114 helped them focus on efforts, uh, focus their efforts, and also it proved to be a very good resource. It turned out to be very user-friendly, and most of all, it was a uh, a representation of best practices for investigation and supervision of defendant and offenders with monetary penalties. Well, good. Thank you, Ken. Let's, uh, let's move on to step two. Each of these steps is, is so important and uh, perhaps equally difficult, but this one is uh, that process of getting the support of the external stakeholders. And uh, there's a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of people that have uh, vested interest uh, in, in this process. Clayton, can I ask you to uh, start our discussion on that? Certainly. And, and again, this is probably the most important aspect of when you're starting your implementation, and that's how you approach your court, your, your judges. And whether you decide to simply inform your chief judge and allow him to inform the other judges or to do it on bank or through a memorandum form really should be governed by the culture of your individual courts and how you've handled these type of situations in the past. Perhaps the best thing you can do is provide a written summary regardless of how you're going to notify the, the court, uh, providing both inf information as to both the administrative and statutory changes that have occurred because of the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act. And there is a reference in the executive briefing packet which will assist districts in providing that type of summary to the court. And again, before charging forward with notification, discuss among it yourselves the best methods to do that with the remaining judges for districts that are very large and have a large geographical area so that the information gets out in an expeditious manner uh, to all the judges, which will alleviate some problems in implementation down the road. David, care to chime in? Well, this is one of the areas where I, I really recommend that chiefs do some heavy lifting in the implementation process. Uh, I recommend, and I think we've all agreed, the chief needs to be meeting with the chief judge and perhaps with other judges um, in, the, in the court to talk about 114 and what it's supposed to do. Uh, perhaps he can or she can uh, attend a judge's meeting, and maybe that meeting can even be expanded to a roundtable with other stakeholders to discuss the changes, the limited changes, and the statutes that are behind 114. I think the chief uh, can emphasize the fairness and objectivity of the PO's role in determining ability to pay, and it's very important to emphasize fairness. We need to emphasize also the collaboration that's required between the court, the USPO, 
the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FLU unit uh, and the criminal AUSA in meeting the requirements of the statute. We need to be careful as, as probation officers not to appear that this is some kind of secretive draconian effort to get as much money as possible out of defendants. Judges have a difficult uh, job and they have to weigh the desperate circumstances of, of many defendants as well as the plight of many victims that, that uh, appear before them. And judges appreciate, I think, the time that we spend talking about 114 and monetary penalties as long as we are fair and we're relevant and we, we're legally accurate and base our comments on statute. Shane. Following up with what Dave said, there's a couple of things. This is a good time to reaffirm our role with the courts. And it's quite simply, you know, that we want to provide fair and thorough investigations when we're dealing with financial monetary penalties. Also, we want to make recommendations that are consistent with an offender's ability to pay. And probably most importantly, we want to follow through. We want to update the information that we have. Um, we want to continue to look at tax forms and, and their circumstances. Obviously, when it warrants, we're going to increase payments, and in some cases, we'll actually decrease. But this is a good point to just reaffirm to the court that what our role exactly is. Good. Well, let's move on to uh, still staying within in the, in the courthouse, if you will. Uh, let's look at the, the relationship of that stakeholder with the, uh, with the clerk's office. Clayton, you care to make some comments? Sure. The, the clerk's office is an integral part of this entire process. They are, after all, responsible for putting together the judgment and commitment order from which the rest of us then take our lead in the collection process. It's very important to include them in the memorandum of understanding process early on for two reasons. One, so that they know whose job it is to clarify victims' addresses, which will make their job easier when formulating the J and C. And also, in the larger districts, we've seen some of these problems where not all the courts are using the same judgment and commitment order. The new judgment and commitment order, which has been promulgated for the monograph 114, from what we see, hopefully will eliminate some of the language problems that have made collecting a little difficult on the post-sentencing side of, the, of these is, on this issue. I would say also that perhaps it's not a bad idea to actually have the language formulated by probation and the U.S. Attorney's Office in assistance with the clerk's office. So that non-consistency in the past can be eliminated. Excellent. I think Clayton has a very good point. And, and once again, this is a place where the chief can jump in and meet with the clerk uh, personally. Um, they, can, they can emphasize the collaboration that's really required to write an appropriate MOU and to make sure these judgment orders are, are available to all of the courtroom deputies. You can also talk about documentation required in the collection process. The clerk can also uh, help in gaining some support um, among members of the court. Good. Yes, uh, to follow up on that, the language itself when working with the clerk's office offered to help train the clerkroom courts, the deputies. Uh, work specifically on languages that are perhaps new to them for lump sum payments or payment immediately. Again, so that after the sentencing is completed, the U.S. Attorney's Office has all the capability they need legally to start the collection process. Okay. Let's move uh, outside of the proverbial courthouse and go to the U.S. Attorney's Office, a big stakeholder in all this process. Clayton? Perhaps one, of the biggest, <laughs> perhaps one of the biggest stakeholders in this process since they do have the statutory obligation for the collection and we work with them as a collaborative partner in this entire process. The, some of the things that we might recommend as points in the memorandum of understanding that would be important to highlight on our, for our point is discussing the ways victims are going to be identified, how their addresses are going to be formulated and provided to the correct people, including victims' notices. Um, one of the important things we found out is don't always assume that there's intercommunication among offices within the court family. You may want to consider having in the memorandum of understanding a section where the U.S. probation officer is responsible for providing a copy of the pre-sentence report to the FLU, the financial litigation unit, and not assuming that they are getting that from their criminal attorneys. We have found that's not always the case. And also, again, discussing lump sum or old doing payments immediately uh, that can be incorporated into the plea agreement, again, helping get most of the collection process done as early on as possible before these assets have a tendency to disappear. Shane, would you share with us your thoughts? Sure. Just a couple more things that I think should be included in the Memorandum of Understanding. And first is uh, the memorandum should identify ways that the U.S. Attorney's Office can actually help the probation office in their collection efforts. I think that's very important. Secondly, 
the memorandum should address that the U.S. Attorney's Office will provide the probation office access to financial information they have. That may be um, through their files or it may be information that they could get through other governmental entities. And finally, I think it's very important that the memorandum establish that the Department of Justice is still ultimately responsible for the collection of criminal monetary penalties. The probation office role is to make sure the offender is in compliance with their conditions and, you know, to assist the U.S. Attorney, but it's still the Department of Justice's primary responsibility is to collection. So we seem to be going around the table here. David. I think this is a very important discussion. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's is a very critical stakeholder. Uh, as early as possible and to the greatest extent possible, we need to be involving the U.S. Attorney's financial litigation unit in our implementation process, perhaps uh, in our training. Uh, we need to determine uh, if just exactly what the flu unit's influence is within their own office, and can they help us in our contacts uh, perhaps they can help us acquire uh, victim information, information about loss, uh, determination of the amount. Uh, perhaps they can help us in, uh, in collaborate with criminal ASAs uh, by working with, uh, with plea agreements and, uh, of course, in assisting us with collection efforts. I think it's important also from a fairness standpoint to remember that everything that we say to the, to the U.S. Attorney's Office needs to be open and transparent uh, so that it's in the uh, defender's office can know the process that we're going through and, and examine it if they need to. And speaking of defense and defense counsel, uh, let, let's take a look at th that stakeholder. I think that's uh, sometimes that's a part of the court family that we have a tendency to ignore because we, th we think of it as probably the more adversarial aspect of what we do with. But it's really important that we bring them on board as quickly as possible in this entire implementation process. I would suggest providing them with a copy of the monograph 114, even for their purpose of eliminating some fears as to what changes are going to be coming down that will impact on their job of being an advocate for their defendant uh, or their client. Um, discuss the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act and the requirements that that statutory statutorily places on the probation officer. And also, you may want to warn them that the Department of Justice may be sending notices to collect early on so that they're not surprised by this and they may have formulated a response or dealt with the Depart or Department of Justice early on in order to uh, alleviate problems down the road on that end as well. David? I think it's very important to recognize the uh, legitimate interests of the defender in mitigating financial penalties. Uh, at the same time, I think we can be honest and assertive in regarding our obligation uh, to get accurate financial information on all defendants and in the collection process. We need to emphasize the process uh, and the fairness of our process and the court's need for information over the collection process. We don't want to get hooked on the resistance and perhaps even the anger that's generated by some of these changes. And we don't want to argue the legal merits of these changes without the assistance of the U.S. Attorney's Office. Good. Well, that takes us through step two, uh, our first two steps here. We're going to go into a, a five-minute break. Uh, we've covered a lot of territory in a relatively short period of time, so we're going to give you a break uh, for a couple different reasons. First of all, to sharpen your pencils for steps three and four that will be coming, lots of, of ideas coming, uh, coming then. Uh, also, a chance to talk with each other, process a little bit about what you've heard so far, and please take this opportunity, if you have any faxed in questions for us, uh, get those to us at this point in time. Uh, the questions we're really looking for are, are related to, to, to implementation. So it'd be a great uh, time, the, the fax in number is 1-800-488-0397. We'll be back with you in a few minutes, and please take advantage of this opportunity to, to complete your, your rosters and get ready to complete your evaluations at the end of the broadcast, because we'll really need your feedback. Back with you in five.
Welcome back. Hopefully uh, a little sharper now. I had a pause for a cause. So far we've covered planning, step one, and we've also talked about the process of getting support of the external stakeholders. And we're going to move on to step three at this point, and that's the process of, of getting internal staff on board. Before, before we start that, again, just a reminder, please get your faxes to us now. They have to bring them across the, the building and, and get them into us, for which will be our next segment. But step three is that process of getting internal staff, uh, staff members on board is, we all know, is really essential. So we're going to start with, we're going to start with Shane, and we're going to hear from our, uh, our remote districts, and uh, well, let's have at it. Shane? Well, there's some preliminary things that you need to do, and one of the first things that you need to do is decide if you're going to train your supervision and pre-sentence units together or separately. Whichever way you choose, there are lesson plans in the implementation kit that will help you out. There are benefits to both, and local concerns will dictate which one you choose, but if you do the joint session, obviously you can stress the interrelationship between the pre-sentence officers and how the supervision officers will later use that information that they've developed. If you decide to do separate trainings, the benefit to that is, is that you can tailor the training to those specific units. If you do that, though, we would encourage you, again, to stress the inner working relationships between the pre-sentence unit and the supervision units because it is a collaborative effort. It is a team approach, and that's very important. The next thing that you should do is look at the implementation kit. Again, if you haven't gotten it yet, you will soon. There contains a lot of good information in there. There was a lot of time and effort spent in developing it. Anything that you might need to get started will be contained in that kit. You might have to revise it a little bit for your district concerns, but for the most part, you'll be able to pull it out and use it to get started. You know, Shane, you're bringing out an interesting point. I think one of the things that districts may find as they begin this implementation and training process is they're going to uncover the fact that many of their officers may not be very comfortable with this whole concept of financial investigations, which is really needed in order to feel comfortable with the implementation process of the monograph 114. And you want to make sure as a district that you provide this additional training uh, in financial investigation so that comfort level is there so they can concentrate on the implementation issues and not just on the monetary and, and the, the nuts and bolts uh, of the monetary collections. As a note, you may, we may want to let districts know that the financial desk reference has been updated. It now contains all the new forms that have been promulgated for the monograph 114. And this would be a perfect time to dovetail financial training with your district and the implementation of the monograph. Glad you mentioned that because we, we'll have a segment a little bit later with, with Kate Linett uh, talking to that and just giving a, a short update. Shane. Okay. Sure. Just a couple more points. It's very crucial that the SUSPO understand their involvement with the implementation of the 114. They are the gatekeeper, so to speak. They're going to be the ones that determine if the officers are implementing the monograph, if they're reviewing the forms like they're supposed to. So they play a very crucial role. If they do not do their job, quite frankly, the chances of implementing the monograph successfully are going to be greatly reduced. So it's very important that they understand that role. Also, we've talked about it very briefly, but again, it, it bears repeating that the chief needs to lend their support to this project. You may consider having your chief be at the training and just talk for a few minutes to show their support. If that's not an option, maybe sending out a memorandum or an email prior to indicating that they support the project. It's not just some passing fad and that we as a district, um, you know, are going to continue to, to use it and, and it's not going to go away. Um, there are some also just a few training tips that we would like to offer you when you're at this stage. And the first is, is that when you're outlining the monograph, make sure that the officers understand the setup of the monograph, but it's very important that they understand why the monograph came about. If they understand why it came about, they'll understand the processes more and the importance of it, I think. Secondly, uh, you need to discuss with the officers how the monograph's going to be implemented. They need to know the timetable for training, when it's going to be started, if there's going to be reviews. Uh, that's all important for them to know, and so you need to keep them as informed as possible. Also, again, you need to emphasize that the 114 just consolidates existing policy. It's not this new beast out there, that it's actually a tool for the officers. Um, it's been pilot tested, and there was very good feedback from those districts that were involved. And the officers need to recognize that, that, you know, it, officers, other officers have looked at it. They've made suggestions. Um, we've revised the 114, that it is a very effective tool. Also, officers should understand that their role has not changed. Um, they're not going to be asked to do anything that they shouldn't have been doing uh, before. We said again that the Department of Justice has the primary role uh, for financial col or collection of financial monetary penalties, but the officer is there to, to make sure the offenders pay into their best of their ability and conduct thorough investigations. 
And finally, I'd just like to point out the new forms. I think this is a highlight of the 114, and I think you should spend a little bit of time on it. The financial affidavits and the forms are much more encompassing than the old forms were, and this is going to benefit the officers in several ways. First off, it's going to allow the offenders not to say that they, quote, forgot to include the information like they did on the old forms. Secondly, it's going to allow the officers to make payment schedules much more easy because they're going to have all the information in front of them. It's going to be consolidated in a very user-friendly type format. And kind of a third benefit, it will allow the transfer of cases from officer to officer and even district to district to be much more easy because if all the offices, all the districts are operating off the same sheet of music, there shouldn't be much discrepancies when a case is transferred from uh, one officer to the other or again, even from district to district. Dave, some pers perspectives? Well, one of the things, I, I'm going to uh, lean on the chiefs once again and I think uh, the, the issue of of getting the chiefs involved in training is, is critical and um, I, I believe that that whatever you say to your your troops the chief needs to be there and needs to back up and emphasize the need and the changes that are that are really focused on in 114. Yeah I think that's one thing we've, we've seen throughout the pilot that that that, that, that support is, is so important. Clayton let me go back to you. Well, more there's, thoughts. There are some things I'd like to emphasize for the districts that are going to be implementing this new process and and that's don't become overly concerned about what appears to be a very cumbersome monograph when it comes in the mail because you're going to find that it does not require a great deal more work than what you were doing in the past. In many cases it may not require any additional work. You're simply going to be changing your tools as opposed to your work habits. The monograph 114 can actually make the officer's jobs easier because the forms are now set up so that it makes it easier not only to collect the appropriate information and data but also to analyze it which is an aspect that it wasn't always done as effectively as possible in the past. We also found in, in looking at the data coming back from the pilot test projects that for the most part for the, for the vast majority of the information we saw officers have found that the new forms were very helpful they weren't very much more difficult to use and that the the process was actually going to be an assistance to them in, in performing this very vital duty that they have to the court. We also want to make sure we point out to these individuals this is not a passing fad. This is not the flavor of the month that's being generated from, the, from Washington or from wherever. This is something that we've been doing. This is simply now being tweaked a little bit so that we can do it better. Um, we want to recognize that officers are going to feel uncomfortable with certain aspects of this, again going back to the training and raising that comfort level in dealing with financial aspects. Historically that's always been an area of concern for supervisors and management when dealing with these type of issues. Don't underemphasize the importance of this training. Don't simply assume because they may have had financial investigation training two or three years ago that that is still fresh. Uh, these are the type of skills that will shrink if they're not used on a regular basis. So ongoing training in this area is vitally important. And again, I'll emphasize what Shane mentioned earlier, the importance of supervisory reviews. Officers will very quickly take their cues from how their supervisors take a look at their work. And if the supervisors don't keep this in the forefront of their minds during every six month case reviews, it'll very quickly go back to the way things were. Yeah, I'd like to go out to our push to talk sites now. Uh, they've been such a, a vital contributor to our to our, our tips and to our, our techniques that we're presenting here and let's go to uh, Louisville, Kentucky to Patrick Craig. Patrick, are you with us? Patrick Craig. Patrick, you with us? Yes, David, I'd just like to reinforce yeah, some of what was Patrick, said Patrick, earlier. Think, uh, turn down your TV set, please. I think we're hearing a little bit of feedback. Maybe that will take care of it. Okay, what I'd like to do, David, is reinforce what was said earlier in reference to the Chiefs doing some heavy lifting, first of all, and that they do play a vital role, but secondly, the most vital cog, I think, would be the participation of the supervisors in the case reviews uh, as to, I guess, continue to voice what has been said, and that's that through the case reviews, they would play a vital part in the implementation and the continued reinforcement of the 114, both as a resource and a training tool for the officers when they deal with this aspect of our job. Okay, th thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that. I'm still getting a little bit of feedback there. Uh, maybe before we get you back on, we'll uh, get to try to get that problem uh, remedied. Uh, let's go uh, way up north, up to uh, up to Buffalo. Randy Beal. Randy, you with us? Yes, Dave. Hello. 
Um, we had uh, we piloted in the district, and the officers were a bit anxious using the new forms. But they tell me after survey that after two or three financial investigations, that they found the forms very e easy to work with, and because they had a greater detailed look at an offender's picture, uh, many of our payment schedules increased. Good. Oh, well, thank you, Randy. If we could get a little feedback there today, too. Maybe the sun and the stars are out of alignment today, but we'll try to get those uh, th those fixed here. And uh, Ken. Uh, out in Phoenix. Dave, I have just a couple uh, things to weigh in on here. First of all, regarding training, just a couple suggestions. Having training materials available, um, including obviously copies of the 114, the revised forms, having the district's policy on minimum monthly payments, allowable expenses, and procedures for receiving and collecting, collecting of monies is real important at the time of the training. Also, any forms that are going to be automated to be placed in the district's automated forms package prior to the training and available for immediate use would be important. Um, I'd also just weigh in and say uh, it's an extremely important thing for SUSPOs to, to be involved in both the implementation and ongoing monitoring of uh, the compliance of the 114 and finally, it's been said before, but I'll say it again, expect staff anxiety and be willing to open it, uh, openly discuss it. Um, the district should attempt to address concerns as they're raised. It may take staff time to diminish this fear. After uh, several weeks of working with the 114, they'll soon see that it just is a refocusing of existing practices. Excellent point, Ken. Thank you. We'll be back with you in, in a few moments. We're going to make a transition as we wrap up step three now and move on to step four. And the step four typically comes a little bit later in the process, but we, we all regarded it as important. And that's the process of, of tracking progress and making adjustments and having that being part of your plan to, to, for that follow-up. And in our numerous conference calls and our hours we've, we've spent together, we, we as a group, uh, including the, the remote sites, we really identified six different components of this follow-up that we want to share with you together. And uh, let me start with, with David to uh, talk about the review of the elements. I think in reviewing the elements, there are some really basic questions that we need to ask ourselves about the process. Did we use a team approach? And did we use the talents and interests and functions of the variety of members of the team, the chief and the deputy chief and the supervisors and the officers? Did we develop a custom plan for our district which was based upon district needs? Did the plan observe the short-term goals of implementing 114 and the new practices? And do we, did we observe the long-term goal of setting up a, an improved monetary proce uh, process throughout the district? Did we produce effective training for our officers? Was that training based upon the statute? Did we reduce the resistance that we, we've talked about uh, by talking about the limited changes? Was the training realistic and relevant? Did we use how-to principles in, in the showing the officers how to use the new forms? And perhaps most importantly, did we build effective communication and cooperation between a variety of stakeholders? with the court in emphasizing the statute and the fairness of the probation officer's role, with the clerk's office in talking about the judgment orders and tracking, with the U.S. Attorney's Office and with the Financial Litigation Unit and our, our Memorandum of Understanding, and with the Public Defender's Office with a, with a true and sincere emphasis on fairness. Good. As we talk about this process of, of analysis, I'd like to go back to Ken out in Phoenix. Uh, Ken, you want to talk about the, uh, the self-review process that you shared with us? Your thoughts on that? Sure, Dave. I think it's important that during the actual implementation that the team get together regularly and ensure that all elements of the plan are being completed. Take a look at time frames. Make adjustments where necessary. Are action steps being followed? Do we need to add any or, or modify them in any way? The team leader should really oversee the process and manage the work of the team and obviously keep the, the chief and the deputies informed. After implementation, it's suggested that teams reconvene after the first six or 12 months and ask the question, did we do what we set out to do? Um, an internal evaluation of, of the implementation. May wish to do it on an annual basis thereafter. The SUSPO's uh, reviews of the pre-sentence reports and case reviews 
do they indicate that staff are following the 114? If you find there um, are areas to improve, go ahead and make those, uh, implement those improvements. Um, ask why things aren't going the way they should. Elements of the MOU between the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Clerk's Office, were they being followed? Ultimately, ask the question, what could we do better? Good. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, Shane, I'd like to go to you to talk about uh, your thoughts in terms of determining some of the impacts uh, in the, of the implementation. Sure. After you do the self-review, you're going to want to look at see what was the impact of the implementation and how are we going to track it. Obviously, there's a bunch of different ways that you could do it, and we're just going to offer three. And the first way is quite simply to look at the total percentage of offenders that had a monetary penalty outstanding that were paying towards that prior to implementation of the monograph and then look again after six months or a year after you've implemented it. If there's been an increase you could obviously say there was a positive impact. Another way is using the supervisor review. Looking at the supervisor audit reviews when they're looking at case reviews or pre-sentence reports, look to see if the officers were abiding by the monograph. Were they doing what was required? Were they following up on financial information that needed to be reviewed periodically? And the third thing that we looked at was, did your overall collection rate increase? And we just want to just a little bit of caution here if you use that measure, because remember the 114 was designed to help officers conduct more thorough financial investigations and collect pen penalties consistent with an offender's ability to pay. One of the side benefits from that is that many offenders are going to be paying more money than what they should. But what you have to remember is some districts have been doing these policies and these principles in the 114 all along, and so their collection rates may not increase, and so just use that is a caution if you're using the collection rate as an overall um, tool to see how well you implemented the monograph. In our discussions, thank you, uh, we've talked about the importance of the role of the supervisors in this process. Clayton, would you share some thoughts on that? Sure, I'm going to hammer the supervisors again. You're one uh, of them. <laughs> I'm, that's right. Actually, Shane brings up a very good point, and I, I mentioned it earlier, several people have as well. Probation officers will take their cue from what they see as important to the supervisor in the process of conducting a case review. If the supervisor glosses over the financial collection data that's in the file on those files that, where that is important, that's very quickly is going to become apparent to the probation officer and they're going to spend less and less time on something that they don't see as important to their immediate supervisor. So it's vitally important that the supervisor not only make sure that the forms are in the file, but the analysis has been done on the information conducted. Too often we'll have seen people, I collected the information but I never looked at it. So it's as valuable as not having collected it at all. And this will give the supervisor as well a chance to really implement his coaching as, and or his mentoring skills or to push that off on perhaps one of their specialists in this area to bring all the officers up to that level where they will feel comfortable gathering this complicated information and basically separating the wheat from the chaff and and doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is the best effort they can for the victim without creating a new victim on the part of the offender's family. Good, 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 good point. I'd like to uh, invite comment uh, from Patrick uh, down in Kentucky. And Patrick, be sure you try, let's try to crank that volume down on the TV set to uh, try to eliminate the, the uh, feedback problem. Patrick? David, again, uh, I guess as to the use of the supervisors and their role in this, I think it is imperative as to what they do, and, and not only just from case reviews and pre-sentence reviews as we've talked about, but even from the day-to-day -day activities when the officers, when they approach you on specific issues which may be related to, in a uh, certain way, the financial obligations that the people currently have. Thank you. And uh, we're going to go from south to north here, and let's go to, to Randy as we move on to our fifth area, ongoing training and follow-up. Randy? Hello again. Um, I would suggest that districts create an in-house uh, financial team to conduct desktop reference training if it hasn't been done so um, already. And once that team is in place, they could uh, perhaps give yearly refresher trainings. And I think it's crucial for the supervisor, again, the supervisor, is to um, identify officers who might be weak in financial work and to provide additional specialized training for them. Good. Well, thank you, Randy. And uh, last but definitely not least, uh, Ken, let's go back to you. Uh, you put together some thoughts and ideas that you shared with us uh, with regard to specialization and, and those people that have an interest with regard to, to financial investigation. Dave, yeah, I think that it's uh, real important for districts to consider tapping their internal resources 
officers that have an interest and expertise in financial investigation and supervision. Uh, these may or may not be specialists at, at uh, the given time. Staff with uh, experience in the financial desk reference, perhaps training on that in the past. Most certainly staff that have automation skills and knowledge, perhaps business and accounting skills. Most definitely those that have statutory and guideline knowledge regarding to mo uh, monetary penalties. They can be an excellent resource as trainers for the publication 114 and, as mentioned earlier, the financial desk reference. They're a resource and ongoing consultant to staff. They certainly play a role in helping to demystify the financial cases and belay staff anxieties. And I, I would w add one more thing here. Um, following our piloting here in the District of Arizona, we really made the decision that we wanted to have a financial specialist on staff and have just created the position and filled it, and we are going to have that person assist in the training, the implementation, and working with other agencies um, as we go about uh, putting the 114 into effect in our district. Good. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, we've now covered the, uh, the basics of the, the four steps, uh, the four-step implementation process. Um, and you've heard from the six pilot districts who were involved and hopefully you've started to glean some ideas in terms of your own action plan at this point. You also heard a little bit about the importance of ongoing training and as we uh, welcome Kim and David back to the studio and get prepared for our Q&A session with your faxes, we'd like to uh, inter introduce Kate Linett, Senior Education Specialist here with the FJC who's been doing a lot of work. He's going to share with you the latest on the, the new financial desk reference and, and other FJC initiatives that are coming. Hi, and thanks, Dave. Let me take a couple of minutes to talk to you about the financial investigation desk reference. As you know, it was originally published by the Center in 1995 and has been used since then by literally thousands of officers out there to help them collect, verify, and analyze financial information on defendants and offenders for both investigation and supervision purposes. The desk reference is divided into four different chapters that cover everything from basic financial investigation techniques to the more complex financial investigation techniques that you'll need for corporations and for individuals with substantial assets and who are perhaps owners of their own businesses. Um, over the past couple of years, districts have used the desk reference as the primary tool for training in district of groups of officers. And individual officers have learned to keep it close at hand as literally that just-in-time training tool that they can turn to to help them answer the questions that inevitably come up in any financial investigation. And the three things that they have found most useful that we know about are the sections that talk about what information to get, where to get it, and how to use that information. As you may recall, last spring, we put a copy of the second edition of the desk reference up on the DCN with updated tax forms. And since then, we've been working very closely with field officers to update the desk reference yet one more time to ensure that all the information coincides with monograph 114. So all the changes that have been brought about by the monograph are now reflected in the desk reference. Uh, as we speak, I'm happy to announce that the desk reference has been sent to the printers, and in a couple of weeks we should be sending information out to the districts on how to order copies for all of your officers. One other thing that we're hoping to do next spring is to send trainers out to the districts as you request them to help in consultation with you on how to improve your financial investigation efforts in your district. So if you have any questions, need additional information, please don't hesitate to contact me, and my phone number is 202-502-4115. And let me turn it back to Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, appreciate that update, and hopefully people will find that information helpful and give us a call if we can be of assistance. Uh, we have some faxed-in questions here. Roy, really haven't had a chance to go over these in, in any detail, so I'm just going to sort of toss some of these out and uh, you know, invite comment. Uh, a comment about them and uh, across the studio we have Kim and David joining us again so uh, I can see them way over there uh, and uh, let me see my signs of age are coming here I need the uh, first time publicly see me in glasses here got a question here uh, uh, expressing uh, wondering about the two month time frame and whether for the pilot testing and whether that was really enough time uh, to adequately test the process uh, 
Kim, let me, do, let me toss that one to you. Two months time does seem like a short period of time to pilot uh, test a, a monograph of, of this size, but I tell you there were a couple considerations that we, w that we made. First, if we had extended the pilot test for a period longer than that, we would have missed the committee cycle and therefore the monograph wouldn't have been to deliver to the field probably for another nine months or so. And secondly, I think as you've heard throughout the uh, panel discussion, our, our, pilot, our pilot course certainly had a lot to contribute to um, design changes and content changes that were made. They were really energetic. They got in, rolled up their sleeves, and had a tremendous amount of advice for us as we went into the final stages of development. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Any other uh, comments on that, that pilot testing in terms of what you found? I'll, I'll speak briefly about the supervision aspect. I, we did, actually, I will say something about PSIs as well. We did find that the short time frame may have caused a problem in effectively testing the forms in a pre-sentence format because of the time frames when we get a case where we have to is initiate the investigation and the information comes back, oftentimes the time frame between when we started the PSI and when it was finished didn't give us the time to really evaluate how effective these forms were. However, on the supervision aspects, we found them very effective. Uh, we had implemented the forms to virtually everyone who had a, an outstanding financial obligation, and we found people paying, in some cases, paying their debts off immediately once they were given these forms to fill out. Uh, we're not sure if that was because they didn't want us to find out more about their information, but certainly we found, as far as the supervision went, that two months was enough time to give us a pretty good reading as to how effective these forms were. Okay, thank you, Clayton. Let me move on here. A uh, question from Ohio Southern. Uh, are changes to the pre-sentence report format anticipated? If so, how and when will we receive guidance by way of revisions to monograph 107? Kim, I, let me talk, give that one to you again. We took a look at monograph 107 and what we discovered is that when we made the, uh, the monograph 114, we fit it into the current format of 107. So as a result, for example, how you lay out financial information in the pre-sentence report is unchanged. Uh, the victim impact statement in the uh, 107 gives you advice about information to include. We expanded upon that. So basically, we fit the monograph 114 into the existing policies provided in 107. Okay, thank you. We move on. Uh, question about the, uh, the short form and the use of the, the short form. A again, another question for, for our panelists over there. Uh, can you give us some insights in terms of more information on how the short form or the forms are to be used? Well, that's actually a, a good lead in into the first question. Uh, the pilot pr uh, groups that actually field tested the monograph came back to us with the suggestion about the creation of a short form. During the time frame that they took a look at the monograph, they discovered that we had this very long form that really only spoke to a small percentage of the overall defendants in the system and that we needed to develop a, a short form that spoke probably to the majority of the cases. And so it was, in fact, our pilot courts that actually brought that advice back to us and we developed that form in relatively short order. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving right along here, a little, what seems to be a little bit of a broader question. Are there any other suggestions for getting judges on board? Uh, David, this one's coming your way. <laughs> Thank you. you. you, you As chief, that's, a, that's what you get the big bucks for, huh? I think the judges in Oregon would agree I'm not always an expert in this area. But uh, this, uh, the answer to this depends a lot upon the, the history and tradition of the communication within the, the individual district. Um, if you have a, a good relationship with your court, the, the chiefs uh, should, should approach the court and talk openly about the processes and required by the Mandatory Victims Restitution Act. They can talk about uh, the probation officer's role. Uh, this is a very fair role for the probation officer. It's a balanced role. It's an objective role. And we need to emphasize that. And I think the court will support the changes in 114 as long as we are open and honest about the need to, to make some changes. These are limited changes, and they are fair changes. Good. Uh, let me ask, uh, any comments from there or from our remote, remote sites on judges, things that you find working? I know I'm putting you on the spot. OK. That's OK. Uh, yet another quick query here is uh, for the implementation team members. Any immediate benefits you saw from, from moving this process forward, from implementing this? I think one of the 
most immediate things that we saw in our district, and it wasn't unique in our district, was that the offenders paid off their fine and restitution rather than having to fill out this paperwork because, as you'll see, it takes a little while to fill out the paperwork. They have to attach receipts to it and so forth, and it was a significant amount of money. I'll just share that last week, just one officer alone, uh, two people paid off a total of $17,000 rather than having to complete the forms. So that was a very immediate and positive result from implementi implementing the monograph. Another aspect I found, with the, although we already had in place a monthly budget form, the, the monograph has a monthly budget form as part of their implementation. And this has allowed officers on a routine basis, on a monthly basis, to be able to track expenditures by the offenders so it's done almost on a line item basis so that we can, instead of every six months or every eight months, really find out where the money is going and where we might be able to reduce the outflow of the offender and redirect it towards the victim. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a couple minutes, the couple minutes we have left here, I'd like to invite any of uh, our remote sites, you folks or, or Kim and David, any final words of wisdom uh, as we wrap this up? You know, pieces of advice as you've implemented this, uh, things to remember, things you want to reinforce. I would just say that the monograph is a very positive tool. It will benefit officers, and once they get used to it, they'll see that, and it's just going to take a little time and development for it. But again, it's a very useful tool. It accomplishes what it set out to do, and so I would really encourage districts to, to aggressively train people and accentuate the positive on it because it, it definitely is a tool for the officers that will help them. I think, too, you'll find that the monograph for the first time has placed all the information and all the statutory obligations that we have had in one convenient location instead of having to run to one reference for one thing and then another reference for the investigation material it is now packaged in such a way that the officer can find everything they need and in a sense which validates many of the things they've been doing in the past they can now point to something and say I've been doing it right this shows me I've been doing it right and it gives me some direction to maybe do some things a little better as well as doing it right Okay. Well, we've covered a lot of territory in, in the last 90 minutes. David, did you have something you wanted to? Uh, just one last thing. I wanted to mention uh, just an exception to it, to what Clay mentioned about everything being in the monograph. I mentioned early in the program that there was a um, th th there was some analysis about the case law regarding payment schedules, but the monograph is not intended really to be a legal manual. There's, it's simply uh, that's beyond the scope of the monograph. I just want to let officers know that we're trying to provide information on the legal issues um, surrounding restitution and fines and other monetary penalties in the more traditional ways. Check the Federal Correction Supervision Division website, uh, the legal section. Um, there's a, uh, a category called financial conditions. It has a lot of letters on it. There are two extensive articles in looking at the law written by my colleague Kathy Goodwin. Uh, there's a lot of information out there on the legal issues. Um, but the monograph doesn't include uh, everything you need to know on, on legal issues. Well, let me take this opportunity to thank David and Kim for their loads of work and, and months of participation in getting us to, getting us to this point and for being part of this part of this broadcast. Uh, our remote sites, any final thoughts? Our remote sites, any final thoughts? No? Okay. I do want to publicly and personally thank you, uh, our remote sites, even though they couldn't uh, uh, spend a night in a hotel room here in D.C., uh, whether it's not that wonderful here this time of year anyhow, but uh, no, for their really months of, of hard work and for contributing to our, our research and our development and, and, and contributing to the development of this broadcast. So we appreciate having you folks literally on board. Also to these three folks here, uh, my, my fellow panelists, uh, you've worked uh, long and hard, and, and I certainly appreciate uh, your contributions and a chance to work with you. And I, I do want to do a, a special recognition to somebody who, who's, you'll be your last trip here to D.C. after uh, 28 years and uh, you know how many times across country. David, I wish you the very best in your, your, your new, new venture and your new life. Uh, we're going to miss you here. So uh, Thank you, David. So I will miss you also. A good deal. Okay, as we wrap up, uh, we've covered a lot of territory in 90 minutes. You've heard of, from Judge Rosen about the need for the monograph. You heard from John Hughes how the monograph was developed. You heard about the objectives and the organization of the monograph uh, from the two authors, uh, the two uh, renowned experts, uh, Kim and David. Um, you've heard from excerpts from chiefs, uh, the pre-taped excerpts we provided, and uh, hopefully you have a tape you can use uh, 
back home with your, your district level training. You've heard firsthand from, from the six districts who were involved in the pilot testing in terms of what their real world experiences are and hopefully lots and lots of thoughts and ideas that you can use in terms of your own personal action plan. Taking some of those thoughts and some of those uh, ideas and, and making them work for you and in terms of that very unique culture we know you have and, and, uh, back, back home. So, Thank you for being with us today. Uh, if we can be of any assistance, we at the FJC are as close as, as a phone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.